Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 8. One word for a title, not an original title, I'm sure, just the one word for the title, believe. Believe. We're only going to read one verse, it's the verse at the end of a story. I'm always hesitant to use that word, story. It's a verse at the end of a historical account. Story sounds like once upon a time. This is no once upon a time. It would do us good to read the entire account and for me to preach from the entire Bible passage, but I know I won't even get finished with what I want to say from the one verse, so there's no need in looking beyond it. Look, if you would, at just verse number 13. Matthew eight thirteen, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self-same hour. Would you notice in that verse just a couple of things? Number one, would you notice the focus of the verse? Without even knowing the story, you can see immediately what the focus of the verse is. It's in the middle of the verse. As thou hast believed. This centurion came to see Jesus. He needed a miracle. And Jesus' response to him was, as thou hast believed. Based on this man's believing, everything else in this story hinges. If he had no faith, no miracle would have been accomplished. But because he had faith, because he believed, a great miracle will be done on that day. The English word believe in its different forms is used over 245 times in our New Testament. Over 245 times. That's not counting a totally different word, which has a similar meaning, which we use even more in the New Testament, the word faith. These two words combine probably in the hundreds, perhaps even in the thousands, point to tell us just how important this ability to believe is is. Even if you're just a casual reader of the Bible, even if you've never read it before, even if you've never ever heard a sermon from it, when somebody begins to read especially the New Testament, you don't read very far before you're impressed with how important, how much to the sinner, the, the, the word, the act, the ability to believe actually is. If that's the case for those who only have a casual knowledge of the Bible, how much more should you and I recognize how important this ability to believe is? Without the ability to believe, nobody can be saved. Without the ability to believe, no one can please God. Without the ability to believe, no one can even purposely receive from God. Now, God's a bountiful God, a merciful God. He gives things all the time, even to people that don't believe, but to purposefully receive from God. You can't do that unless you can believe. Would you notice the focal point of that verse is believe? Second, would you notice the promise that Jesus made to the centurion? Because he believed. Again, just a handful of words. It's in that verse. So be it done unto you. As you have believed, so be it done unto you. What a promise. If you've got faith, it's potentially unlimited. If you have no faith, perhaps it has very little potential. But the reward for a person who can believe, that promise was an unlimited promise. As you have believed, in accordance, in ratio, in dimension to the faith that you have, to the ability that you have to believe, so be it done unto you. The centurion had come to see Jesus. He sought a miracle from Jesus, not for himself, but for a servant. Not for a servant that he had brought with him, but for a servant that was at some undisclosed location. When the centurion asked Jesus for a healing for his servant, Jesus was prepared, offered, was willing 
to go with the centurion wherever the servant was so that he could answer his request, meet his need, give him his miracle. But the centurion had so strong of an ability to believe, he said, that's not necessary. He says, I understand. If you are who I believe you are, you don't have to go see him. You can just speak the word and it will be done. What a powerful faith that man had. What an ability to believe. And you need to remember he was a centurion Roman, Roman soldier, Roman centurion. He's not coming to a Gentile Messiah. He's coming to a Jewish Messiah. And yet, his ability to believe in that Jewish Messiah is off the scale. It's interesting. Many people read the, read the story. They read the account, and it never even dawns on them. We don't even know if the man who got healed had any faith at all. We don't know whether he was Jew or Gentile. We suppose this Gentile centurion coming to this Jewish Messiah, he's coming because his friend, his servant, was Jewish. But we don't know whether he had any faith in Jesus at all. But because of this man's ability to believe, whether the servant had any faith or not, he still got healed. He came seeking a miracle. And just in this one verse, we know he got it, the last line of this verse, and the very same hour the servant was healed. Notice the focus, believe. Notice the promise, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. That promise is not made to us. This is a specific promise made to a specific person who had a powerful faith and who came for a very specific miracle. So we can't out and out claim that whatever we can believe, God's going to do for us. But I think there's application there for us. And I still believe that God does reward us in proportion to our ability to believe. If we have great ability to believe, I believe God will give to us great rewards. If we have no ability or little ability to believe, I suspect we will receive from the Lord no rewards or little rewards. With that background, I want to preach this message to you. I've entitled it simply the one word, believe. I, I debated a long time about calling the, ver the, the message, I believe, because I want to share with you some of the things that I believe and what I believe I receive because of what I believe. But I don't want it to be a message about me. I hope it's what you believe as well. And I hope it's about what you're receiving from God as well. Let me give you a short list. It can't be a long list because I had to stop before I got even halfway finished with the list. Let me give you a short list of some of the things that I believe, hoping you believe these too. Number one, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the eternal, almighty, everlasting Son of God. By that, I don't believe He became the Son of God. Some believe that Jesus became God, that he was born a mortal man, and at some point on his pilgrimage through this life, he became God. Some believe maybe it was at the cradle. Some believe maybe it was uh, at, the, uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane. Some believe it was literally at the cross that he became the Son of God. But I would tell you this morning, that's not what I believe. I believe he's the everlasting, the eternal the Almighty, the Son of the living God. You say, preacher, why would you believe that? Well, because of a lot of Bible verses, let me just give you one, just one. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 17. The latter part of that verse says this, and by Him, talking about Jesus, and by Him all things consist. The word consist mean are. Because of Him, because of Jesus, all 
things, all, and, and that, that, that word, uh, that, that phrase, all things, you ought to put that in quotation marks because that's literally out of the verse. All things are, they were created and they are sustained by Him. All things. I don't know what your definition of all things is. My definition is, if it's a thing, it's part of the all things. I mean, if it's all things, it's everything. Well, all things would include this world and all things that are on it. Quite often when I think of Genesis chapter 1, I see God the Father step out on the edge of nothingness and with nothing but His words, summon out of nothingness the heavens with all their stars and the earth, and it just assembles before Him. I, I, I don't know why that's my image, but it always has been, even though I know now it's not scripturally correct. To be honest, I never should have limited it to simply God the Father to begin with. If I was going to imagine anything in my mind, I should have seen the Father maybe standing in the middle, and the Son maybe standing on the right, and the Spirit of God standing maybe on the left, and all three of them speaking the words, and all, it, uh, all that is just assembling before them. But that's actually not what Colossians 1.17 says. Colossians 1.17 doesn't say the Father created and holds all things together. Colossians 1.17 doesn't say the Spirit created and holds all things together. It says by Him, a reference to Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, all things consist. All things. All things that have physical nature. This vacuum of space, this galaxy that all these universes are within. Uh, all this space with all the stars and the planets. All this nebula. All this, this vast amount of unknowable wealth. Jesus Christ stood out on the edge of nothingness. And with nothing but a word and a thought, He caused all things to consist. Question. Question, if he's the one who created all things, how could he have not been God unto the cross? I mean, if he created the planet that he was born upon, how could he not have been God unto the, how could he have not been God to the cradle? Uh, he had to have been God before he was born. How do I know that? Because by him, all things consist. He created it before he got here. He didn't become God. He's always been God. But then that, that phrase, all things, all, all, uh, that means even more than just the heavens and the earth. Maybe man's time began with the creation of the heavens and the earth. God's time has no beginning. Yet if it's a thing, if it's some Thing, it consists, it is, it was created, it's held together by Him. I don't know what things there are beyond the dimension of our planets, of our solar systems, of our galaxies, of our universe, but whatever things there are, guess who made them? By Him, by Jesus Christ they exist. I know that there's at least one other place besides this earth, this galaxy, these heavens that we're in. There's God's heaven. Most of the time, we think of God's heaven as being eternal. Most of the time, we do. We don't really think it out. We, just, we figure, well, God's eternal, so His heaven must be eternal. That's not true. While God's eternal, no thing is eternal. Everything that is, even the heavens, had to have a point of origin. God, the eternal one, created even the heavens that He lives in. Guess who created the heavens where God lives in? Colossians 1.17. By Him, all things consist. Even the heavens where God abides consist and is because of Him. I don't know all the things that are in heaven, but the Bible does tell us some things. You've got the book of Revelation. You've got books of Isaiah. Ezekiel give us some images of what heaven is like. We don't know all the things that are in heaven, but we know some things. There's a throne of God in heaven. Revelation chapter 4 talks about the throne of God. Not that God needs to sit down. Let's face it, God's a spirit. I don't think he has anything to sit down with. But he's got a, he's got a, he's got a throne 
Guess who made the throne? It's a thing. By him all things consist. Who made the throne of God? Jesus Christ made the throne of God. The Bible in the book of Revelation talks about a sea of glass being before the throne of God. Now, when I read the book of Revelation, I'm not always sure what's literal and what's sometimes symbolic. And to be honest, I've, I've, I've never got full peace about whether that sea of glass is a real sea of glass or whether it's symbolic. But if it's a real sea of glass, if it's an it that's literally there, guess who made the sea of glass? By him all things consist. If it's a thing, I know who made it because Colossians 1.17 tells me. For by him all things consist. But it's not just things that are in heaven. There's beings that are in heaven. We don't know who all's in heaven. We don't know what all is in heaven. Only what the Bible reveals to us. Uh, just a few beings that are in the heavens. Uh, one, one being that's in the heavens is the Bible describes four living beings. Creatures. They're talked about in the book of Ezekiel. They're talked about also in the book of Revelation. Uh, they're, they're described in those books, and their description is almost identical. There's a little bit of difference between them, but their description is almost identical so that we know that there's four living creatures that must have been in the heavens for a long, long time. Maybe there's more than four. The Bible just mentions four. As far as we know, there's a whole family of, of these living creatures, or maybe a, a whole race of these living creatures. But there's at least four living beings that stand by the throne of God to serve Him. Guess who made those four living beings? All things consist. Jesus made those. The Bible talks about angels being in heaven. There's at least four different kinds, that's not the right word, but I don't know what the right word is, four different ranks, four different types of angels. The Bible talks, first of all, about, we'll call them the archangels. There's some beings in heaven, they're, they're angels, but they're called archangels. Uh, there, there's only a few of them that we can read of in the Bible. Micah is an archangel. Apparently an archangel has much more power than a normal angel. Created that way, endowed with more abilities. Guess who made the archangels? By him. All things consist. And then there's the angels. And, and those now divide into two categories. The, the angels that stayed and the angels that sinned. So we got three categories. We got the archangel. We got the angels that stayed. And we got the angels that sinned. Usually we refer to the angels that sinned as demons now. They're those that walk around and give us all kinds of problems. Guess who made all these angels? By him all things consist. Oh, but there's one other angel who stands head and shoulders above all the other angels. I believe he is a cherub. Book of Isaiah, I believe it is, called him the cherub that covers. I think he's angelic. Maybe he's a unique race all to his own. But Lucifer was created as a cherub, which is even a higher rank than the archangels. Lucifer, we don't use that name much anymore because it's too pretty of a name. It literally means son of the morning. Usually it doesn't mean that to us. We've seen too many bad movies where Lucifer's revealed in his true nature. But we usually call him the devil or Satan nowadays. Because we know how powerful he is and we know how far he has fallen. Guess who it was that even created Lucifer, son of the morning. By him all things consist. Now I'm going into all things not so much for us to understand the greatness of God's power, that God could create all of these things, that Jesus could create all, though, though we ought to stand in awe. I mean, we worship the God who's created all things. We ought to stand in awe. But I, I bring out these all things to help us to understand that what the Bible says is true. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning, Jesus was the Son of God. He's always been the Son of God. He will always be the Son of God. I believe Jesus is the Son of the living God. I believe.
Number one, Jesus is the Son of the living God. Number two, I believe, let's take it a little bit closer to home now. I believe that Jesus was virgin born. I believe that Jesus was, what does that mean, virgin born? I believe Jesus, it means he was born without the aid of a man. And it means he was born without the stain of sin. He was virgin born, born without the aid of a man, born without the stain of sin. In the book of Luke chapter 1, you, you don't need to turn there, but Luke chapter number 1, a conversation is taking place between Mary and the angel. Mary's being told that she's about to house uh, the son of the living God. And she asked this question, verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? See, and I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Something supernatural happened on that day. A virgin conceived to bear a child. Now, in order to really comprehend what, what I'm describing here that I believe, we need to back up a little bit. I need to give you a statement. The statement I want to give you is, as God is so Jesus was as God is so Jesus was the Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 4 verse number 24 that God is a spirit the Bible refers to the third member of the Trinity the Holy Ghost as the Holy Spirit Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3 says you can't see him but you can see his effects it's like the wind you can see the effects and you can feel the effect why can't you see the Holy Ghost why can't you see the Holy Spirit because he's a spirit God the Father is a spirit God the Holy Spirit is a spirit as God is so Jesus was in our mind, we see Jesus as a babe in the manger, as a man hanging on a cross, as a risen Savior. But that's only of recent times. In eons past, Jesus was a spirit, like the Father is a spirit, and like the Spirit is a spirit. You say, well, when did things change? Long about Matthew chapter number one, when Mary is told that she's to conceive a child. You say, why did things change? Because Jesus desired to do something that a spirit can't do. A spirit can't die. People ask the question, is there anything God can't do? Yeah, there is. A God can't die. God can fix that, and he did fix that. Jesus, God's son, in the eternal spirit nature, the eternal form of God, took upon him, Paul wrote, the form a man. He literally, as you would put on a suit of clothes, he literally put on his body, put on his spirit, a body. He literally robed himself in flesh. Now, he's not robed in exactly the same way you and I are robed. He couldn't just use natural processes to get him a body. You know natural processes. Man, woman come together, conceive a child, and a new body is born, a new baby is born. He couldn't do it that way. Why couldn't he do it that way? For two reasons. Number one, anytime the natural processes are followed, a new human being, a new soul is created. That's one of the reasons why we're so violently against abortion. When a man and a woman come together, they don't just create a body that you can throw out in the trash. They create a human soul that is eternal. And when you snuff out the body that's been conceived, you kill the soul. You cut short the life on earth of that soul. But Jesus didn't want to borrow somebody's body. He didn't want to share somebody's body. Jesus wasn't coming to steal somebody's body. So he could not have a body that was made through a man and a woman coming together. For if a man and women came together, it would have been a human soul in that body. Jesus needed a body all to himself. That makes sense? So he couldn't just use the natural processes because there'd have been a person that had to be displaced for him to use that body. Not only that, but if he'd used the natural processes, there would have been a sin, a sinful body produced. 
our evangelist, Brother Willis, preached on this some this past week. He made the statement. He didn't originate the statement. It's been around for a long time. The statement that he made is, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You really need to die, dissect that statement. You're, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're... You know, right? you know where you got your sinful nature? You got it from mom and dad. To be more precise, you got it from your dad. I'm sorry, guys, but uh, the truth of the matter is the Bible, Romans chapter number 5, says two or three times that it's the Father, by one man, sin entered in the world, and by one man, death by sin, so that all have sinned and all die. Why? It's because men pass the sinful nature down to the next generation. You got it from your dad. Your dad got it from his dad. Your, your dad's dad got all the way back to Adam, the sinful nature. So if, if, if Jesus had created a body through the natural sources, the natural means, the natural processes, n- number one, would have had to displace somebody because he'd have had to hijack the body. Number two, it would have been a sinful body. So what God did was something new and different. The angel told Mary how it was going to take place. Somehow the Holy Ghost himself, don't know how, somehow the Holy Ghost was going to create a seed to go with Mary's seed. This divine seed would have no sin. It's being created by God himself, and it's being placed inside of Mary's womb so that this unique virgin seed, this divine seed being placed inside of Mary, it has no human being being created because it's not following the natural processes. It does not pass any sinful nature down because it's not through Adam's seed. It's a divine body. And then at some point once that body is created, Jesus Christ just moved in. And now he's got a body born of a virgin. I believe that. You say, preacher, do you realize what you're saying? You sound a little bit delusional. You sound a little bit crazy. That's impossible. You, you can't do that. You're right. It's absolutely impossible for man. I'm not talking about what I believe man can do. I'm talking about what I believe God can do. I think we've worshipped ourselves so long that we've limited even what we think our God can do. Hey, the real God's not limited by man's inabilities. The real God is God. He can do whatever God wants to do. If he can stand on the edge of nothingness and create all things, my friend, creating a body for Jesus Christ to live in is not a difficult thing for him at all. I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Number three, and I'll hasten. I got a long list, but I knew I wasn't going to get through it. Number three, I believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe Jesus was virgin born. I believe Jesus lived a sinful, excuse me, a sinless life. I believe he lived all 33 and a half years without ever saying a wrong thing, thinking a wrong thing, or doing a wrong thing. You say, preacher, again, that's impossible. It's impossible for us because we're born with that sinful nature. Not impossible for him. Book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15 says, He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are. And that's, that's completely true. That's what the Bible says. But I actually believe he was tempted in all points, even those that we have never been tempted in. You see, the truth of the matter is, there's been no human being lived long enough and resist the devil long enough to go through his whole bag of tricks. You go back and you read Genesis chapter number three. How long did Adam and Eve stand before the devil before they fell? 15, 20 seconds? I mean, and, and that, was, that was the best warfare that there's ever been. This, this man had no sin nature. This man had no desire to sin. This man was simply being beguiled by the devil. But you can read that whole conversation in less than a couple of minutes. How long is the longest that any man has ever stood before the devil? Up until Jesus, just a couple of minutes. Jesus stood for 33 and a half years. For 33 and a half years, the devil cast every trick that he's got, tricks that you and I have never seen, tricks that have never come out of the bottom of his bag before, never needed them before. And Jesus withstood all of those. Why? Because he is the son of the living God. He is the everlasting Savior. I believe he walked all 33 and a third years. 
And he never sinned, not once. I don't believe he ever thought a wrong thought. I don't think he ever said a wrong thing. I don't think he ever reacted in a wrong way. I believe he's the sinless son of the living God. Number four, I believe that Jesus is the substitution for our sins. I believe he died a substitutionary death for us. The word substitute means instead of. I'll give you a Bible verse, book of Romans. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 8. You, you don't need to turn there. I'm just passing through. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. The word for means instead of. Christ died instead of us. I believe that Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, was not dying for his sins. He was virgin born. He had no sins at birth. He lived a sinless life. He had no sins when he died. He did not die for his sins. He was dying for the sins of someone else. I believe it's most appropriate to say he was dying for the sins of everyone else. There's some who say Jesus didn't die for all. That he only died for the elect. It was limited atonement. Do you understand what God commanded us to do? He said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what the gospel is? It's good news. The, the word gospel means in the Greek good news. Go and preach the good news to every creature. What's the good news? Jesus died for you. But if Jesus didn't die for everybody, then everybody hadn't got no good news. You know what you'd be telling a person if Jesus didn't die for him? You know what you'd be, you wouldn't be giving him good news. You'd be giving him bad news. You'd be saying, listen, sorry, you can't get saved. He didn't die for you. You say, well, he doesn't know that. It don't matter whether he knows it or not. God told us to go preach the good news to every creature. You don't have good news unless Jesus died for every creature. Jesus Christ told us that he died for us. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. I'll go this far. I believe he died for me. Jesus Christ died for me. Brother Willis last week gave a little bit of his testimony. He said he got saved when he was five years old. Then he made this statement. It made me think he's had a problem when he makes that statement before. He made this, I don't remember the exact way he put it. He says, if you've got a problem with a five-year-old getting saved, don't take it up with me, take it up with God. As if when he'd given his testimony before, somebody had come up and said, hey, five-year-olds, they're too young. They can't be getting saved. So he made that statement right, right after, I got saved at five. If you've got a problem with that, don't come talking to me about it. Go talk Go, go talk to God, because that's what he did. He saved me at five years of age. As though a five-year-old could not get saved. Five-year-olds can get saved. Understand, it's not brain power that gets us saved. If it was brain power, I'm, I'm afraid 50-year-olds wouldn't be getting in either, okay? It's not, it's not how smart you are. It's whether or not you have the ability to believe and the ability to surrender yourself to God. And granted... It, with small kids, we're not sure if they understand the repentance part. Uh, they understand, I think, perfectly the dying part that Jesus died for. That's not hard for them to understand. But they don't sometimes understand the repentance. But then again, I'm talking to folks right now, and you still haven't understood the repentance. Uh, God can save anybody that can believe and anybody that can repent. This past week, we've had another national sorrow. The count that I had, I think it's accurate, 19 boys and girls, not counting the two teachers, 19 boys and girls murdered in a classroom. All of them from the same fourth grade class. By my calculations, that would put them typically at 10 years of age. Maybe there was a, a, a child who got pushed in a little early. Maybe there was a nine-year-old. Maybe there was a child or two that got held back. Maybe there were 11 or even 12 years of age. But, but the target age would have been 10 years old. That's the average of what those kids would have been in that classroom. 
And I've seen a lot of people mourning, and well we should. It's a national tragedy. It's a personal tragedy. It's a tragedy on so many levels. But I'm not sure we've actually understood the full ramifications. Ten-year-old child is old enough to believe in Jesus Christ. A 10-year-old child, if told, if taught who Jesus is, is old enough to make a decision to surrender themselves to Jesus. Not all of them. I know some of them are are less mature. Some of them, like I said, I've met some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60-year-olds. They still don't seem to have all the wherewithal to make the right decision. But typically, a 10-year-old child, if they've been told who Jesus, if they've been preached to, if if they've understood and been they they can trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I saw a picture just a day or so. It's amazing. I love artistry. I saw a picture, and I knew immediately he was drawing these little kids. Uh, maybe you saw it on Facebook. That's where I saw it. But just a whole herd of kids, backpacks, just eight, nine, ten-year-old kids, and they're running up this, this upraised platform. They're, they're running up this uh, help, sidewalk that goes up. I can't think of the right word. Right. Uh, they're running up this platform, and there's Jesus up at the top with his hands wide open. And then they got a, a black ribbon up there as he was mourning. I hope that's true. I hope all 19 of those boys and girls had been told who Jesus Christ was, had, had moms and dads that, that, that did their best to get those kids to Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, if they're old enough to have understood, and even if nobody told them who Jesus Christ was, even if nobody told them, if they were old enough to believe, if they had the ability to repent, even if they had never heard who Jesus Christ was, they didn't get to go to heaven. You understand why we have vacation Bible school? Why there's a children's church going on back there right now? Why we've got Sunday school classes for kids? Because you don't get an exemption because you're still young and cute. Once you're old enough to believe, once you've got wherewithal in your mind to repent, You have crossed the age. I don't know what the age of accountability is. It's not an age. It's a place where you understand. You may not know Jesus, but you could have known Jesus. And in this day and age where kids are all wrapped up in t-ball and cheerleading and dance and all, I'm not against some of these things. But I'm telling you, ain't none of those things going to take anybody to heaven. You better get your kids to church. You better read the Bible to them. You better live Jesus Christ in front of them because kids die too. I believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. I've got to stop. Not completely yet. But I'm going to stop telling you what I believe because for a few minutes, just a very few, I'm going to give you the second point in the message. I'm not finished with the first point, but I'm going to give you the second point of the message. What does believing do for me? I believe in these things. What does believing do? Four things real fast. Number one, because I believe my sins have been forgiven and I have a home in heaven because I have believed. And let's, let's make this real clear. clear. Uh, it's not because I have believed all four of these things that I've mentioned to you thus far. Uh, now it's good for you to believe and know as much as you can, uh, but, but you don't have to uh, have known that Jesus is the same. You, you don't really have to have understood it. You don't have to know that he was virgin. You don't have to know that he lived a sin. You really don't have to know those things to be saved. If you're driving down the road and there's a wreck in front of you and some poor soul falls out of the automobile and you rush up to them and you can see they've got the last few minutes of life in them and you want to tell them how to go to heaven, you don't have to say Jesus is the Son of God. You don't have to say Jesus was virgin born. You don't have to say Jesus lived a sinless life. No, all you've got to do is, is just tell them that last one, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. And if you will repent and surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, you can go to heaven when you leave this life. It's that simple. Like I'm, I'm telling you, you don't have to have a degree to be saved. Salvation is not brain knowledge. It's believing and it's surrendering. And because I know Jesus died for me, my sins have been forgiven. And I'm going to heaven when I die. I hope that's true of you. Number two, because I believe these things... You believe much, you get rewarded much. Because because I believe these things, I know God. I'm not just talking talking about, I know about God. I know God. Once you become his son, he becomes your father, and you begin to meet 
this almighty God. I'm not saying I've got a private line to God. I'm not saying that, 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 that I see him in visions. I'm just saying as you become his child and begin to follow him and read the book, you begin to see God's not just some distant stepdaddy. You begin to see who he is. You begin to see the son for who he is, the, 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 the spirit for who he is, the father for who he is. You have a relationship with God. I got one. You say, preacher, you're being very arrogant. No, I'm being very factual. Because I have believed, I have reward that people that don't believe can't even begin to comprehend. They would dismiss me as a fanatic, as a right-wing nut. And I'm good with those titles because I am nutty. But I'm telling you, because I have believed, I have some rewards. I know God. Number three, because I have believed, I can serve God. I get to preach. I get to tell people about Jesus. I get to teach. Those are what I get to do in my service, some of the things I get to do. You get to serve him too. You get to give money and offerings to worship him. You get to, you get to teach Sunday school classes. You get, you know, we get to serve God. People who don't believe the book can't serve God. God didn't call the angels to be his servants. Not on this plane. God called the people who would believe to be his servants. And number four and last, because I believed, I will receive some rewards when I get to heaven. I won't get them all. If I just hear him say, welcome home, that's, that's good. Not expecting a whole bunch of crowns. Not expecting anywhere near the master's presence. It might take a telescope to see me. I'm, I'm so far away off of his right-hand side. That's okay. That's okay. But when I, when I get to heaven, because I have believed, I know he's going to give me some rewards that those that have not believed will not get. Tie the message. Believe. Just one word. Believe. I believe. I hope you believed. Because if you believe, guess what? You can be saved too. Your sins can be forgiven. You go to heaven when you die. If you believe, guess what? You can know God too. Not just as some character out of a thick, big book, but you can know him as the God, the personal God that speaks to you, that loves you, that has a plan and a purpose for your life. You can serve God. And that's an amazing privilege that most Christians just don't seem to appreciate. And you can be rewarded if you believe. If you've never believed on Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to do that this morning, this very hour. If you have believed on Jesus Christ and you're not living for him, I can't think of a better day. Well, yesterday. But I can't think of a better day that you're going to get. This day would definitely be better than tomorrow. Why not surrender everything to Jesus today? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach to. Lord, I pray that you speak to some hearts that many would believe today. Whatever is necessary in their life, that God, they would lay it upon the altar and surrender themselves to you and great things would take place because of the decisions they're making today.